Ինչապես նաև ասեմ, որ բոլոր դպաները, հարցերը, եթե տալիս եք միկրավոնով միայն, որ թարգման չի ենք կարողանա թարգման ենք։ So I just warned that all questions and all talks should go through the microphone that the interpreter will be able to translate. Please welcome Fred Kellerman here. You know, it's a 13-year, 13 golden apricot that we are uh, we have in year one, and uh, starting from second one, uh, the master classes started. So it's uh, 12 years that we have master classes. And um, Fred was in uh, year one in 2005 with his film Fallen, and also after that he worked with Karine Torosan on Karine's uh, film as a cinematographer in 2006, probably, or before that. So you came before, okay, that's my fault. Um, I'm not going to tell too much about uh, Fred Kellerman because many of you already saw his uh, cinematography work because two years uh, ago or three years ago, uh, Turin Horse was in, on screen in Yerevan, Bellatar's film, and also uh, Fred did three, in total three films with Bellatar, uh, but he was, he started as a cinematographer and director in 93 with his student work, then 94 his diploma work. He won um, German Academy Award for his diploma work. And uh, then in 95 film with Bellatar, correct? If something wrong, you just need to correct me because I'm doing that by memory. <laughs> without any, uh, yeah, and a uh, few other his works, which is you will be, we are all happy to see in retrospective, in retrospective of uh, Fred's films that starting today, there will be four films included, one his only cinematography work and three his directing cinematography works. So. Please pay attention because all films will be shown on 35 millimeters. It's, it's a request from director and he's shooting only on 35. Uh, his last film was shot in digital, but it's not uh, released yet. And we will see in his retrospective program also the film released last film, which was made in Georgia and director with uh, Ge Israeli director, but with Georgian last name. <laughs> okay. And uh, I don't want to spend your time because it's uh, Fred's time and we will talk about different topics. We already discussed in advance that it will be interesting to present you because uh, also Fred, in addition to his uh, filmmaking work, he is doing the teaching in different university. And if I'm not wrong, last year he started to work with in Moscow. It's a new school in Moscow, film school, and I think mostly I see the young generation here. It will be very interesting to discuss as much as possible. And you should be very active on your questions because it depends on you how well our today's master class will go. Fred is not going to make any lectures today. We, are pre we prepared a few clips to show and talk in between, so floor is yours. Welcome to Armenia. And this is thank you. So first, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. And uh, thank you very much for coming. And um, I hope we will uh, have a short but nice time together. You want to start? Yes. Maybe just just a few words uh, regarding the way we will do this uh, so-called masterclass. Um, not knowing um, who will come, what are your interests, uh, what's your background, we decided that I'm not sitting here and just uh, lecturing, which anyhow I don't like so much. So we just agreed that uh, he will start uh, with some questions, uh, talking about things which are important for him or him 
might uh, mm -hmm. think important for you and uh, the questions and the answerings will lead us um, to a wider space, let's say. So every question, of course, can be a reason for making bigger uh, uh, excursions into uh, some practical theoretical um, uh, talks about uh, film or maybe even life. And also if uh, after a few talks, if there will be questions, we we'll let them ask, correct? Yeah. No, no, it would be very so. nice if we can uh, come into a kind of communication together. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's hard to avoid the questions or not to start with uh, Bella Dark questions because uh, my first impression for uh, cinematography work that uh, Fred did, it was the Turin Horse when a few years ago I saw on, uh, on the screen in Yerevan and Belatar was here, it was a very big pleasure for us. And I was really amazed by the work that you did together. Uh, and visual part was so strong for me. So, and then after studying uh, his other works, I, I saw old works of Belatar, but also I started to see what, what he did recently, then I realized that Men of London, from London also, it's your work uh, as a cinematographer. And uh, we, the question is, I mentioned that in 95, you already started to work with Bellatar. So I would like, I, I'm curious how you met Bellatar, how Bellatar chose you, or how you met Bellatar, or if there was any influence of Bellatar works on you before you met him. So those kind of questions, like just to open the floor and then we will go forward. Thanks. So um, I met Bella, Bella, um, Bella accidentally in a, in a cafe in Berlin. He had a retrospective in a cinema there and um, I was around the corner of the cinema, there was a cafe and I was sitting there and this guy was sitting in the same cafe and somehow we um, looked to each other and um, I don't know, that sometimes it happens that you look to somebody and something happens. And uh, then two days later, I met the same man, suddenly in the office of the film school in Berlin. And uh, he remembered me, and I remembered him from the cafe. And he asked me what I'm doing there, and I explained to him that I'm studying there. And he told me that he is giving a three days uh, workshop for um, students of higher uh, grades, of older students. So I was not uh, even a, uh, a part of this workshop. But somehow he told me he wants me to participate. So um, I uh, went then to the um, uh, head of studies, to the head of the programming in the film school, and I told him that uh, for three days I will leave my class and uh, will participate in Bela's workshop, which was in a cellar uh, in, the, in the film school. So I disappeared for three days in the cellar and uh, participated in this workshop. And um, because not um, being a, a member of these higher uh, or older classes, I um, did not realize an own exercise, but I was doing the camera work for the older students. And um, so that was a moment when Bela and me started to get to know each other. So he saw how I moved the camera and from the beginning of my um, studies at the school, I was very much um, um, interested in the movement of camera. And um, so we, had a, we, we somehow had a similar feeling for film. And uh, from this moment on, after these three days, um, we agreed to meet each other again when I'm uh, in Budapest, because I have family in Budapest. And in this time, I went uh, a lot of uh, um, times during the year to, to, to Hungary. So when I went next time to Budapest, I called him, we met, and so this friendship started. And in uh, 1995, I just uh, uh, was in, supposed to finish uh, the film school. Um, he was shooting a film in Hungary, and he asked me to come and to, to shoot it with him. So it, the title is um, Journey to the Lowland, and it was based on um, poems by the Hungarian poet uh, Sandra Petrefi. And that was our first work together. And then um, we kept 
going on with our friendship and our collaboration. So it was the first personal meeting and then a collaborative. You didn't know yes. his works? I saw one film of his. Before? Before. Yeah. And uh, that's not, not more, just this one film. Great. So, because it was beginning and we were talking about the beginning during the... So, uh, after I saw the men in London, I think the, the very impressive two pieces that was in the film, it's the beginning, how it starts. So maybe you should talk about how, in general, or anything that you want to talk with uh, uh, regarding the filmmaking and cinematography, but uh, how important the beginning of the film, the opening shots, why it's important or it's not important at all. We talked about it a few days ago, so I think it's uh, one of the very important topics um, when you make films is to think about the beginning and the end of your film, because um, the beginning of the film is like the birth, and uh, the end is like uh, the death of the film. So the beginning uh, is just after the darkness in the, in the screening room uh, um, is destroyed, let's say, by the light of the projection. So it's a moment when the film really comes to life. So it's very important to think about, how, not even the first scene, but the first image, the first second. So how does the film start? Because that's not only uh, the moment when the film is born, uh, um, but it's, um, it's a moment when the audience is um, facing the film first time. And I think the first moments in the film are very, very important regarding the question if um, the film creates a connection with the audience and vice versa or not. So I think in the first minutes, uh, the deal is happening. If somebody wants to follow the journey, the film is offering or doesn't want to follow. And I think the first minutes should um, have all the ingredients, let's say, of the whole film on the screen. That's a moment of the um, pact the film is doing with the audience. And the same uh, thing happens uh, in the end, That's, um, because in the end, the last moments, um, are the ones which remain somehow. They echo into the darkness after the film finished. And like in life, I think it's quite important how we are born and, uh, and especially how we die. So um, these are the very, very important uh, parts, I think, of the film. The beginning and the end. Between, just life happens. So you just have then to manage to come from the beginning to the end. And that's why it was his wish to uh, show the beginning of the man from London and to talk about it. It's a very complex scene and um, not only regarding the camera movement but um, regarding the choreography between the camera and the actors. The timing is a very important aspect, of course. Um, who enters when and in which part of the, of the scene. So we had to, um, we were rehearsing it for, um, let's say, half a night. And uh, other night we were starting already to, um, to shoot some takes. And then on the second night we shot more takes, and one of these takes is in the film. So uh, altogether, I think it was work of two days, of two nights, let's say. And how, how many takes you did? I don't know. I don't know. A lot. Because it takes some time until, uh, until the whole um, choreography re really works, and uh, not only that uh, everybody knows what to do in which moment, but... Um, until the flow exists. It's more than just um, knowing the positions. It has to have a certain magic also. And th this um, has to be created. And it, it needs time. <laughs> Any questions regarding the scene that you see? But when I microphone over. Mr. Kelman, thank you for sharing your experience with us. 
I have a question regarding the lightning. Uh, were there any artificial light, lights besides the ones that we saw in the sea? Um, everything is artificial. But, uh, because it's night but, and... Uh, yeah, but we saw a lot, uh, most of the lights in the scene. Is, is, were there any others except the ones that we saw in the scene? Um, of it, in, uh, I try to understand your question. Um, oh. Of course, all the lights are artificial. Because sure, sure, I, I, I will sure. But most, no, of the, the, I most of them we saw in the scene. I, I understand you. Just be patient. Oh, I'm starting yeah. to answer. <laughs> Sorry. I, I will give you an answer, believe me. So you, in, you talk about the scene or the whole film? The scene only, right? Uh, the scene. Yeah, of course. So all the lights are, of course, artificial because it's night. And in the night, there is no sun. So we have no natural light in the night, except uh, maybe fire. But as long as you use no fire, all the lights we have is artificial. And of course you have uh, in every, or many films, I think in most of the films, you have the lights um, where you see the sources, where you see the lamps, and you have lights where you don't see the sources, where you don't see the lamps. So in this uh, scene, of course we have the lights you see, the lamps you see, like the big lamps uh, on the station, which give light to the train and to the boat. And um, we have uh, uh, the light of the lighter, of the main character when he lights a cigarette, which gives a light to his face for a moment. And of in, inside the um, cabin where he is uh, working and where the camera is also moving, we have more lamps, of course, which give light to him when he moves uh, in front of the camera, when he goes through some shadow goes through some light, this comes from some lamps which you don't see, which were um, in the cabin. So it was, of course, it's a mix of lamps you see which give light, and lamps which give light and you don't see the lamps, but you see the effect of the lamp. Was this your, um, an answer to your question? Of course. Um, the phrase you told in the beginning, something you sometimes you look at somebody and something happened, like it caught me very much. Uh, I wanted you to uh, tell a little bit about how uh, this phrase works during filmmaking, during your career of filmmaking, and do you change your mind there? How the first sight is important for you? I think in general it's very important to um, to be aware about what we see. And um, of course when we, we talk about uh, films, I talk about the visual aspect in film and in life. But um, you also can uh, understand it in a more metaphysical sense because we cannot see only with our eyes. And um, but we can detect things with our eyes, with our mind, with our ears, with our other sensors we have. And I think if all these sensors come together, we are able to see something which is even beyond or behind the visible. And about these things, uh, and these things I think matter. So um, also in a film, um, if, um, if you make decisions in the f uh, regarding the shooting, which location to choose, which uh, actors to choose, with lighting to choose and so on, it is all very much related to the seeing. And to the question if something, what you see, creates something in your mind, if there is a certain taste or magic or whatever which is uh, stimulated or not. And uh, so I think this is a very, very important aspect that when you see something, when you look at something, something should happen. If nothing happens, then maybe it's, uh, it's empty or you cannot connect with it. I think this is uh, the feeling when you feel that something happens, when you watch a certain person, a location, object, light, whatever, it's exactly the moment of, uh, of connection. And I think this is something what we should try to, even not to create, but maybe to, to give it a chance to, to catch it. 
because most of the things we cannot create, but we can be ready for it, and we can create a space for things to happen. We cannot make so many things happen, but we can create a space for this. And um, to get into um, communication and contact with it. <clears throat> so I think it's a um, I think it's a very important question because, especially in my work with students, I very often experience that um, the way decisions are made are very often made on a purely intellectual level. For example, that somebody um, has in his mind a certain idea not only the story he wants to tell or the film he wants to make, but very often the problem is the idea you have about your story or the idea you have about your film you want to make. And um, this idea can even block you because you are um, then just trying to find uh, uh, um, possibilities uh, uh, to, 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 to um, prove this idea, let's say, or to create this idea. But I think we cannot create ideas. We have to uh, follow certain ideas we have, and we have to uh, find something behind this idea. I don't know if you understand what I mean, but um, if intellectual decisions, it's very often intellectual decision does not lead to this, what I talked about before, to this m moment of magic, let's say, or to um, a connection, because it's too superficial very often, these decisions. And I think it's a very important thing to try to connect also in yourself, um, your intellectual level with your um, um, intuitive level. Like, what do you mean when you say, like, uh, we don't need to create an idea? Like, there is an idea in your mind, and what should you do with it? Follow it. Follow it? To follow it. Follow it. No, we cannot create anything. It's a, it's a complete misunderstanding, I think, because we are completely empty. We cannot, uh, from where shall we create? We only can uh, receive, let's say, and then to transform and to um, follow and to um, bring things together. And this creates maybe something new. But it's because of uh, what we put together. I can give you a very simple example. If you um, take two colors, let's say, a certain red and a certain yellow, and you put them together, side by side, and then you take the red, uh, let's say, the, um, the yellow away, and you put a certain blue beside the same red. The red will completely change. It will appear differently, but not because the red changed. It's because of the connection. It's because of the relation. The red and the blue have, or the same red and the yellow has. So this connection, this uh, relation, creates something. It's not the red which creates anything. It's not the blue or the yellow which creates something. It's a connection. And I think that's something very important to, to have in mind that um, everything, I think, depends very much on relation. How you bring certain things together. And this connection creates a third force, whatever, different level then, which is beyond or um, more than the single uh, elements. In one of your interviews, when you are talking about your directoral work, you are saying that, um, generally speaking, you are not having the dialogues. It's, you know what will be, they, they should talk about, but you are not creating exact dialogues. And then on, on a shooting, you are, getting the momentum. That's what I would like you to talk a little bit. Because we are going to go to the next clip and, yeah, please. Yeah, it was a beginning, in the beginning, it, it was a big problem for me, for example, to get, uh, it's still a problem, but uh, to get funding for the, for the films. Because the scripts I was writing um, were without dialogues. And um, for example, I was, in one script I was writing in certain moments, and they talk what is necessary to talk about, not more. Or uh, they talk about something which uh, will be clear later. Oh, but I didn't want to fix the dialogues. And um, so I know what they will talk about. I know the subject. I know um, the function, let's say, of the dialogue then, why I need
need this and what for and I what, what I want to achieve with it. But I never um, fix the words before. I fix very clearly the camera movements. I know very well how the scene will be, what lighting I want to have, how the camera movement and the actor's movements will, will happen. But the dialogues are very open. And uh, at the set, I first um, position the actors after doing the rehearsals with the camera. And um, I create the dance, let's say, between the camera and the actors. And then, out of the situation, I develop with the actors uh, the concrete words. So I tell them what to talk about, but not uh, the concrete words. And then I slowly um, build up the text with them. So that's the way I, um, I work with dialogues. And because very often, uh, we don't need them. And um, anyhow, in films, uh, people talk much too much. And I also believe that film is basically a visual uh, art and um, should not work um, basically through um, the dialogues, spoken words. It has a different language, which is not, which are not the words. So uh, some directors, they are giving the actors to have the whole script and some of going them to work with scene by scene. So in your case, it's a scene by scene, or how it works? No, it's a mix. So the main, the main actors, they get the whole script. They know what uh, the whole thing is about. But the other actors only get the scene they're in. So they only know their part and nothing more. Because too much information will spoil the behavior, I think. OK, any, any other question? OK, please, but to microphone. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for this uh, great job. Uh, I saw this uh, the beginning scene and it was uh, really uh, very imp uh, impressive. And uh, so I have a question. Uh, this whole uh, scene was shot by using one camera, yes? And uh, what is the main goal to make uh, this scene uh, only w with uh, using one camera shot? Uh, it was one shot without cut, so it was only one camera. And um, I think the main goal is exactly what you saw. So um, that was the goal, to have the scene as you have seen it just now. And, um, but if uh, your question is um, a question regarding uh, long shots and uh, timing, one of the most uh, uh, interesting thing for me from the beginning was uh, the work with time because time is a very, very, very essential aspect of film. And um, not only the existence of time, which every film has, because it has a beginning and an end, and that's something what the film um, makes very close to music, for example. Film and music are very, very deeply related. Film is much more related to music than to literature, for example. Um, but not to, not to have the, f the time in the film, but to make it, um, make it um, um, visible, to feel it, to, to, to give it a presence. Because I think the film is basically a, a, an art of time, picture and time. And um, if you um, remember the mainstream films maybe, they try to eliminate time. There, the editing is very important, and the editing is there to dynamize uh, the action, to uh, push the story, not to spend too much time with, uh, with things. And this is, I think, uh, a try to, to eliminate, eliminate time, to make time forget. And this way of working is to make time uh, present, to remember time, to work with time. And, um, I think it's a very, very important point. And the interesting thing is that uh, in our lives, in our normal life, let's say, the space is something very real for us. We have the feeling that the three-dimensional space is real. We can understand it, grasp it. We, can, uh, we have a clear idea of objects. And time is something quite metaphysical. In uh, film, is just the opposite. Because film is a two-dimensional art. And uh, space is an illusion in film.
because there is no space. It's just a flat uh, screen. The space we see is like in painting or in photography, an illusion. But the time is real. So the time the man needs to walk, let's say, from one corner to the other is real time, which happened in the shooting, and it happens again when you watch it. So you experience this time with him again and again, as often as you watch the film. And this is for me a quite interesting uh, relation, how real time is in film, and how unreal the space is, and in our lives, our experience, let's say, is a little the opposite. We experience time as something unreal, metaphysical, and space very, very real. But in film, um, time is space. So the time the actor needs to go from one corner to the other, let's say, or the camera needs to move from one place to the other, or if you have a still camera, you observe somebody walking through a space, this gives you a feeling of the space. So time is very much also describing uh, space in film. And these kind of shots um, are aware of it and work with it and make you feel uh, time. Uh, well, the opening scene was really amazing. That long take was, was really awesome. But I would like uh, you to talk a little bit about the sound, the soundtrack, because it was creating like a whole new level for the scene. Are there any specific composers who you work with? Or? Yeah, the composer of this uh, music was uh, is um, Mihai Bik. He's a Hungarian musician. He's a very, very uh, old friend. He's not very old, but he's an old friend of, uh, of Bella. And they worked together for a long time. And uh, he's, he did the, all the music for, his, uh, for all his films. Yeah, we still need to keep in our mind the director of the film, the clip, we saw it's a Bellatar, and Fred did the cinematography. So music, it's a choice of the and sound, probably it's more Bellatar choice than Fred's. But now we probably, if there's no question regarding this, maybe we will move to the next clip, and we, we will talk about uh, visible and invisible, because you want to talk yourself about the next clip? I want that you will talk. Or we can talk after the showing. No, as it was your wish, I think uh, right. we talk after it and uh, maybe we talk about why it was important for you to show it. Okay. And then we talk about the whole thing. I, I don't know how well this clip will work on you because usually, you know, if you are cutting the from film anything, I mean, showing only part, it doesn't work the way how it was designed. I, I hope it will work. I don't know. No, but, uh, but I think we have to explain something because yeah, okay. it's, it's very important before you see the next scene yeah. to understand or to know that uh, in the film there is a man who is hunted by a police guy and uh, this man disappeared. And um, the police guy does not know where the man is. He did a crime and he hides himself. And uh, the daughter of this uh, character comes home and tells him that there was a man in a hut and that she closed the hut. So he knows that the man who was searched by the police is uh, closed, is locked in the hut and he takes some uh, food from home, some, uh, some drink and he goes there to bring him uh, the food. We have, we have to tell more? No, I, I think. don't think so. Yeah. So that's very, very important. Let's see how it's if it will work. I'm sure many of you saw the film, but because we are screening only, I mean, we are showing only part, so it needs some explanation to really understood what we are going to talk after that. So you will see a hut, and in the hut is a man. Inside, inside, yeah. Okay. Luis Serra Huntrem, huh? In this scene, um, he tells the policeman that he killed Brown. I was going to ask what's happened. I'm but sorry. It, yeah. So it's it's a murder scene, but you don't see that. So it's it's that's but when you are watching the film completely from the beginning and you come to this scene when 
camera just stay in front of the door and you don't see, you don't even hear anything specific that uh, tells you that there is something happening, but you feel that. It's an invisible part of the movie that comes to you without any additional need to tell you what's happening inside. So it's, it's, it's that magic that I think it comes with the film. It's, 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 of, it's part of the magic and I think it's very much part of um, the very, very important um, work. <laughs> Filmmakers have to do to, uh, to find solutions and um, to think about a certain economy of uh, narrating, to um, find visual solutions and uh, solutions of mise-en-scene, how to tell something. And if you have um, the task, let's say, to show a, or to have a killing in a film, the question is how to show it. And um, how to show it in a way that um, it's effective, it's emotionally effective, and that is not ridiculous. And um, especially uh, uh, um, Bela and me, we um, try to avoid fakes. And the killing in the film is, um, of course, a fake. And uh, I think this is a more realistic and more true, somehow, way of talking, of, of showing it. Because it, um, it transfers um, the scene to the imagination of the audience. And in your imagination, it's more real, of course, than on, the screen, on, on screen. So this is the possibility to, to, um, to show a killing, let's say, without showing it, but with showing what happens before and after. And um, I think everybody has to ask himself or herself uh, the question, if you, if you make films, how to show things, how to find an appropriate uh, representation of what you want to tell um, in your film. Yes, please. Um, you have an experience of working at theater also. So where is the line between the theater and uh, the cinema? And uh, what can a director show in the theater that maybe is a band in, uh, in cinema? Um, I think there's a very interesting relation between film and theater and, it, and a very interesting effect since film exists. I think theater somehow lost uh, its illusionary um, aspect. So, because it was taken over by film. If somebody, even though I said before uh, about something about fakes, still, if somebody dies in a film, if somebody is shot in a film, it can touch us. And for some moments, it's real for us. Somebody killed on a stage is just ridiculous. We never believe it. So this kind of realism does not work in theater anymore. It was. Before, in the 19th century, there was a completely different way of uh, theater, of course. But I think the illusionary character of theater was taken over by, by film. So you have to find very different um, translations of your ideas on the stage than in front of the camera. That's one of the fundamental uh, differences between film and, uh, and theater. Um, the camera is, of course, a big difference. You have no camera uh, um, normally on a, on a stage. And when you sit in a theater as an audience watching a play, and uh, I don't know if we have a two-hour uh, play, you have a two-hour long total from the stage. But in film, you can change this. You can change from total to close-ups. You have a variation of uh, perspectives, let's say. Um, the acting is different. So you have to exaggerate, let's say, in a certain direction if you, if you work in theater. And you have to exaggerate in another direction um, if you work uh, in film. So the, there's a complete different translation, let's say, of your ideas regarding the question if you work uh, for film or, um, or in theater. What works in a theater, on a theater uh, stage does not work in film and vice versa. Any, any questions? No? 
Yeah, it's, I think it's amazing. Uh, I'm just interested how far your experiment goes because it like it challenged all my perception of like space. You say it's not important, but then you give this huge uh, space scenes in your films, and then the time you give for a person to like to see where your thoughts take you, and then you change, you again give the narrative. So I'm interested how far you go. Like, are you experimenting in all the fields? Like, trying to like challenge all senses we have, all the way we think? In, in every film, I, I try to find something new also, and I'm experimenting. And um, um, like you saw here, for example, the, um, I think it's, it's very interesting to go away, far away, as far as possible, from um, using time just to give information. So I think time should have an own uh, dimension. If you want to give an information that somebody goes uh, to a hut, kills a man and comes out, you can do this in three seconds, of course. But it's not about the killing. It's about something else, of course. And um, this is for me the interesting uh, 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 thing film can do, to go beyond the information. because. The, the unity, let's say, of time and information you have in news uh, shows and TV. And, and TV. and uh, but time has an own uh, reality, and to bring the own reality of time into the film is quite interesting, and to liberate it from the action. So it has an it opens another dimension. I I, I would say the real 3D cinema is um, or the re the real uh, third dimension. It's not a question of, uh, of a fake uh, 3D effect regarding the space, but uh, it's the depth of the time. When time is not uh, uh, linear anymore, but when, for example, a moment stops and you go into the depth of the moment, that's uh, 3D. And um, it's like um, putting a, 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 um, a microscope suddenly in front of your eyes and going deeper into a single moment which normally vanishes maybe very fast, but in this case you can, uh, you can enter it. And you, for, you leave, let's say, the linear movement and you go inside for a moment. And this is something I'm still uh, uh, trying to find out, how far cinema can be pushed in this direction, to go beyond the film, to, to, to go behind the images, let's say, because there are other things hidden. And to liberate also the image from the from the story and from the plot, because um, um, he mentioned that I um, I have a class in Moscow, for example. The school is called Moscow School of New Cinema. So the question is, what is new cinema, or what can new cinema be? And I was uh, giving um, the students an example of uh, Malevich's uh, black black uh, square. What he wanted to do with this. Of course, in the beginning, uh, nobody appreciated very much. And it doesn't look like a big painter if you make a black square. But the idea behind was to liberate the color, because he made more squares, also blue squares and red squares. So um, the idea behind was to liberate the color from the object. And um, so not only an apple can have, let's say, some red colors. And in many cases, the objects are just uh, alibis in painting where for using different colors and creating uh, certain uh, effects. But to liberate the color from the object, if we think about film, I think this could be liberating the images from the story or from the plot. And this is still something to, to develop, I think. Thank you. The, the question about long shot, I just want to go back to that and uh, also to the go forward and talk about education. Uh, generally speaking, the filmmaking, it's, uh, it's a craft and you have to learn how to do and making the long shots, it's not easy task. Uh, probably for new generation, it's really not so 
clear because you push the button on digital camera and you can do whatever long you want, how, how long you want. But in those days when filming goes to the, on the pre, uh, uh, 35 millimeters film, it's really, technically it's really hard to do first of all and it's you can't consume so much tape and that so on and plus how you do that my question to you you had uh, many in your bank educational background you had art you had um, uh, music you had philosophy religious so what's important to become filmmaker as a what you have to get as a your background education what is strongest part what is needed part and so on and also you are teaching now in uh, different universities, in the schools, filmmaking. So, because here are many young filmmakers, so probably that will be interesting to hear. That's a, that's a difficult question. Um, I think first of all, you need a, a burning heart for film, which is really important. And uh, I think music is a very good uh, basic, because music um, gives you the possibility to to experience um, the work with time and um, variation and all these questions, which are very important for film. Any art can help to, to develop an understanding of the other arts, I think. Even the film is an own art by itself. It's not a mix of all the arts. It's something very independent. And um, because the cinegraphic uh, aspect is only present in, in, in film. And um, it needs um, a visual imagination and uh, an ability to imagine scenes, to, to be able to translate ideas into scenes and to think very concrete. Because everything you shoot, you have to create in a very concrete way. And you have to solve very concrete uh, questions. So I think these things are important. And. Um, <coughs> Yeah, to be very practical and <coughs> and concrete. Okay. Uh, questions and to be and to 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 be willing to uh, um, to learn and to 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 learn a handcraft, to learn the techniques, not to be afraid of techniques, but also to um, to think and to um, to develop a vision of, of what you want to do. So these two things are, are very important, to connect the very concrete aspects with the more um, metaphysical aspects. Thanks. Questions, please. Hi. Yes, how are you in Assam? Okay. I'm Arce Kanivurduk. Աշխատում <laughs> Pes film art adrelum nor lezu testu me kte chete amar. No. Why not? I think <laughs> it's a, I think it's a gimmick and um, it's uh, it's maybe a nice game but it doesn't enrich um, um, filmmaking. I'm, that's my impression now. Maybe I'm wrong but um, that's my impression. It's just uh, um, a new fake, and we don't need new fakes. And um, I think we need more reality, but not in a simple sense, not in the, in the sense of uh, a cinema which uh, presents a, a simple naturalism, because the naturalism is not uh, representing reality at all. So I think it's always very important to find a certain way of stylization, because only a certain level of stylization can represent something real in art, because the art, the piece of art itself has a reality. So a film, an artifact, has its own reality. And um, the material of the artifact 
inscribes itself in the artifact. It brings its own reality into the piece of art. And I don't see any, uh, um, let's say, value, artistic value, in the, um, in the world of uh, virtual reality. And it isolates you also. And um, it's more like a technical drug, maybe. What about 3D? Just 3D movie. What about 3D movie? It's a terrible fake too. So, because um, it, it, it's, it, um, I don't see what uh, the third dimension. Um, I'm living anyhow in 3D every day, so it's not new. And um, transferred on a on a screen, it's just a, <coughs> an illusion. So it gives me the visual illusion of a third dimension. But um, I think it's, it does not give a new um, level of uh, uh, artistic expression. Maybe it needs a new step for, for making it more interesting, but this is not ha did not happen yet. So at the moment, it's just um, uh, an effect, let's say. I think 3D can be interesting uh, when uh, we really start to think in this direction. And when, uh, uh, for example, we break the level or the way of use where it's just things come closer to you or more far, but for example, when we are able to go even around things or even to not make just uh, um, illusions about objects, which is very boring, but um, to make other steps with this, more spiritual steps, let's say, to find a way to use it in this direction then maybe it can be interesting. But at the moment, it just creates the fake of a three-dimensional object. So we are very much thrown back to the, to the material level, I think. And the screen is a two-dimensional world. And I don't see any um, um, step, let's say, in uh, creating an illusion of a three-dimensional uh, screen. It would be the same as I if I would tell you, OK, let's Let's have three-dimensional uh, uh, paintings. Why not to see uh, Rembrandt in 3D? What, what would be the um, value coming out from this? Or to see, uh, if I would say, ah, forget uh, this boring uh, two-dimensional paintings of Van Gogh, and uh, let's imagine we see it in 3D, and we can even, we can believe, anyhow, it's a stupid uh, belief, that we can enter the field, you know? So what does it give us, basically? That's a, a very important question. And I don't, I cannot give yet a positive answer to this. Thanks. But as I said, maybe in 3D there is this uh, hidden uh, possibility, but only if we understand it metaphysical, not if we just use it to try to create a, an effect of three-dimensional objects or spaces. I don't think so. Thank because you. I th because I think it's this, it, is, it is something what is not needed. I think what we observe today is a loss of reality. We lose more and more reality. We enter more and more virtual realities through the media, through uh, the internet, and so on. So we have less and less contact with the reality. We have less and less contact with real people. We have less and less contact with real uh, events happening. So we hide ourselves more and more behind a, a, a um, curtain, let's say, of, um, um, of pretending things. And I think this is not what we need, because by, by this we lose more and more the world. But we should get the world. We should uh, be in contact with it. So I think the opposite would be more interesting. Not to um, create virtual reality, but to be able to sense real reality. Because I think this is missing. Uh, um, because of time goes fast, I just want to, till I didn't remember, uh, or forgot, I want to tell you that tonight at 7.30 starts the retrospective with your director of cinematography work your debut work, 94, correct? Yes, and uh, so you are all invited to see and start to watch the retrospective tonight. And uh, I would like to 
yes. go to the last clip that we prepared. Okay, the last clip I have chosen um, because it's related to what we talked before, that you have to find solutions. You have to find always a very concrete visual solution for what you want to uh, show and to what should be expressed. So the next clip is from uh, a film I was shooting in Israel in 2012. And um, there was a long um, dialogue in the film. And I was thinking how to shoot this dialogue. And this is um, my solution for the dialogue, which I want to share with you. Artska, any question? Can, can I ask you to wait till someone else will ask? Because I don't want that it will go to the dialogue. Then if some, no, no one has a question, then you will be next. Thanks. Contrem, Artska. I, I, I remember in Poland that there is also dialogue that two characters are talking for very long. And it's a kind of circle, circle, circle. So here it's a little bit different approach. So, please. And then it will be your question. Yeah, it was, of course, it's, it can be very boring, of course, to, um, to show two people uh, talking for a long time. And the question is what to do with the, with the time. And um, we didn't talk about the scene for a long, long period. And um, just two days before the shooting, we remember that we never talked about how to shoot this. And I met with a director in a cafe. And um, then I proposed this uh, movement to him. Because this move, and it was uh, somehow a coincidence that uh, this movement came into my mind between them. And then I realized it's an endless sign. It's like an endless, it's endless between them, yes. Going like this the whole time. And uh, the topic they talk about, of course, is an endless topic between the Arabs and the Jews, which may never finish, maybe. And uh, so somehow this movement described quite well the um, situation between them. And it was not easy to do, of course. And um, when I told it in the morning, when I came to the set, to the um, grip guy, he said, it's, it sounds terribly difficult. And he's not sure if it's possible. And I uh, told him, okay, let's try. And um, we try step by step. If it doesn't work, I have a plan B to make it easier. And also my uh, focus puller, um, he was really sweating when we were shooting this because at many moments he was out of focus and it was extremely difficult. But he managed in the end so he, and because he's very good also. And so we did this uh, scene. It's just an example for... Um, thinking about a way to, to present uh, um, a scene, let's say, to, to find solutions for things you have to show. And also those kind of scenes, it's always stay in your mind when you recall how it's done. I remember in Fassbinder's films, uh, Marta, there's a circling scenes that you always remember too. Please, your question. So in the beginning you were t talking about like you compared the beginning of the film with the birth and the end with death. Uh, is there a metaphorical life after death? So what happens after the film ends? What should happen to the audience maybe? Of course, if, uh, if the film has, uh, has a relevance, it will live inside you. So the film will have a life inside uh, the ones who have seen it. That's the life of the film after the last um, image uh, faded. No. Uh, it's not metaphorical, it's uh, simply uh, realistic. It's true. If a film has a relevance for you, it will stay with you. So it will continue uh, its life and even change its life inside you. We are almost at the end of our today's meeting. It's really sad, but uh, we are uh, out of time. But I, I want to ask the last, very last question about uh, um, 
digital and not digital. It's it's an old conversation already, of course, but because Storaro already did his digital film and I, you, your last film also in digital, but there was a one very interesting quote in your interview about imitation and not, I would like to talk about that a little bit and then. I mean, what, what we have to uh, face is that um, something very, very important is uh, is getting lost. So film is, um, I mean film, film. Um, 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter or super eight or whatever, it's very, very beautiful material. And it gives us beautiful possibilities um, of photography, of um, working with lights and so on. And the digital quality is definitely weaker. So we are now losing some more precious uh, uh, material and uh, in exchange with uh, the less uh, uh, um, valuable. It's like um, changing uh, real diamonds uh, uh, with, with fake ones. So um, it's sad. It's a really sad situation. And, um, but digital is a fact, so um, especially digital screenings. So this film was shot on 35 millimeter, but it never had a print. So it has only a DCP. And, um, but still we shot it on film. And it was the first film shot uh, in Israel after two years, and it was the last one till now. And um, since uh, several years there was no lab anymore in Israel, and since last autumn the last lab uh, closed in Germany, so there's no Ari anymore. And this is really, really, really uh, tragic, tragic, I think. And we lose quality, we lose uh, possibilities, and with the loss of film, also a whole uh, tradition of uh, handcraft is getting lost. So I see that, um, for example, students, they don't know how to measure light, and they don't know how to think light, because with the digital cameras, for example, they're so sensitive that you can see everything. And this is exactly the attitude that uh, people think we don't need lights because uh, the digital camera is enough and I can see enough. But the idea of making lighting in film is not basically making things visible, but to create with the lighting spaces. It's an architectural element. It's like painting with light. It creates atmosphere. It structures the space. It structures movements. So it's far, it's an artistic uh, 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 tool. It's not just to make things visible. But nowadays, when we talk about light, it's just about visibility. And another big problem with uh, digital cameras is, of course, the uh, display. Um, many people use the display, and they don't use a uh, viewfinder. And um, there's a big difference if you hold the camera a little more far from yourself, if you see the display, and you permanently see the reality, let's say, behind the display and the digital image. If you work with a camera and with, um, with a viewfinder, and you don't see a, a, a digital image in the viewfinder, but uh, just uh, the reality through the lens, um, you are in the image. The own reality is the image. This is a uh, frame. That's reality. And you don't have, uh, uh, you don't compare permanently the reality in front of the lens and your image, what you see through the viewfinder, and you have the camera closer to your body. So somehow the camera is part of, of your body. It's an organ with which you see the world. And by seeing it and uh, pushing the button, you create it at the same time. And this is completely not uh, existing when you work digitally. It also has an uh, influence for the editing and so on and so on. So the technical uh, uh, conditions we have with the, with the digital influences fundamentally the uh, production of images. And um, on another level, we lose the light because uh, film uh, cannot really uh, create deep blacks. And um, by, lo by losing the light, we lose the darkness. And um, this is very much related. This is related to the, to the technical facts. So when I was shooting this film before, I was talking with the people from the lab because they promised me they make uh, a 2K version of the, from the negative, 
and we will, it will look the same. And so I said, okay, let's make a test. I was shooting some tests and we made uh, 35 millimeter prints um, from the original film material and we made it 2K and then we compared it and there was a difference and uh, it was very difficult to describe the difference. It looked almost the same, but not. So something was missing, some brilliance was not in the digital image. So we th started to think about and we started to try to describe what is the difference. Some shining is not there. And we had the feeling that uh, comparing the digital image with the film image, that on the digital image there is an invisible curtain, let's say, or like a plastic, which you want to scratch away to let the light shine more. So something was in front of the image. And we tried to understand what can it be. So what is, uh, what is happening with the light? And then after a while, and they even admit that, that, there is a, that they said, yes, we are, we are right. There is a difference, it's not the same. <clears throat> and then we um, understood that it is related with the fact that digital works with uh, pixels. So pixels are steps, but the film material um, is a photochemical process which has curves and light moves in curves. So the film material is able to catch and to recreate or to represent the light. And the digital image just looks like light. It is not. So even if you have very, very small steps, it will never be a real curve. So it's just uh, a fake. So what we see is a fake of light and a fake of black, and it never gets so black because uh, a digital image always needs an information. So, and uh, on the film, uh, on the film um, um, stripe, the black is just uh, uh, the absence of light. And it is possible to create this deep black. So these are very, very important differences. And I think with losing these uh, aesthetical uh, uh, things, which are related with the technical questions, we lose much more than just techniques or, or, or aesthetical things. We lose a, a way of uh, thinking and looking and uh, um, yeah, we lose a whole world, I think. And um, But because of the fact that uh, digital exists, and as I, and not, uh, and I don't like, uh, of course, uh, fake digital images with just to recreate somehow the look of, uh, of film. It's like a fake uh, pearl, which tries to look as real as possible, like a real pearl. It's uh, more interesting, I think, to, to, to use digital in a way where it develops or shows an own aesthetics, which is different from film. And in my uh, last film, which is digitally shot, I tried to, um, to destroy the digital, to, um, to push it to a certain level where it develops an own aesthetics, where it is not looking like film, just worth, but where it has an own, uh, uh, um, an own power, an own aesthetics. And I think it only works with when we don't use it correctly. So when we start to use it incorrectly, we have to, we have to violate it. And then it develops a certain uh, interesting aesthetics, I think. Thank you very much. We will still have chance to see Fred at midnight, one of the midnight wrap-ups, if you will come, and we will continue our conversation. And I just would like to thank you for coming. Thank you, the AGBU, for providing this nice space. Thank you, Christina, for doing the translation. And thank you, all of you, for being here for this one and a half hour. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. And tonight, we will start the retrospective of Fried Kellerman. You will see three of his films on 35 millimeter. Projection is 35. This film shot on 35, but the projection will be DCP. Thank you very much, and come to get today at 7.30.